some callous hemp could, as a raw material, save the U.S. economy. That's some statement. Some people think hemp may be the epitome of Yankee ingenuity. It is estimated that methane and methanol production alone from hemp grown as biomass could replace 90% of the world's energy needs. If they are right, this is not good news for oil interests. The claim is that the threat hemp posed to natural resource companies back in the 30s accounts for its original ban. When Rudolf Diesel produced his famous engine in 1896, he assumed that the diesel engine would be powered by a variety of fuels, especially vegetable and seed oils. Rudolf Diesel, like most engineers then, believed vegetable fuels were superior to petroleum. Hemp is the most efficient vegetable. In the 1930s, the Ford Motor Company also saw a future in biomass fuels. Ford operated a successful biomass conversion plant that included hemp at their Iron Mountain facility in Michigan. Ford engineers extracted methanol, charcoal fuel, tar, pitch, ethyl acetate, and creosote, all fundamental ingredients for modern industry and now supplied by oil-related industries. The difference is that the vegetable source is renewable, cheap, and clean, and the petroleum or coal sources are limited, expensive, and dirty. By volume, 30% of the hemp seed contains oil suitable for high-grade diesel fuel, as well as aircraft engine and precision machine oil. Henry Ford's experiments with methanol promised cheap, readily renewable fuel. And if you think methanol means compromise, you should know that many modern race cars run on methanol. About the time Ford was making biomass methanol, a mechanical device to strip the outer fibers of the hemp plant appeared on the market. These machines could turn hemp into paper and fabrics quickly and cheaply. Hemp paper is superior to wood paper. The first two drafts of the U.S. Constitution were written on hemp paper. And the final draft is on animal skin. Hemp paper contains no dioxin or other toxic residue, and a single acre of hemp can produce the same amount of paper as four acres of trees. The trees take 20 years to harvest, and hemp takes a single season. In warm climates, hemp can be harvested two, even three times a year. It also grows in bad soil and restores the nutrients. Hemp fiber stripping machines were bad news to the Hearst Paper Manufacturing Division and a host of other natural resource firms. Coincidentally, the DuPont Chemical Company had, in 1937, been granted a patent on a sulfuric acid process to make paper from wood pulp. At the time, DuPont predicted their sulfuric acid process would account for 80% of their business for the next 50 years. Hemp, once the mainstay of American agriculture, became a threat to a handful of corporate giants. To stifle the commercial threat that hemp posed to timber interests, William Randolph Hearst began referring to hemp in his newspapers by its Spanish name. This did two things. It associated the plant with Mexicans and played on racist fears. Nobody was afraid of hemp. It had been cultivated and processed into usable goods and consumed as medicine and burned in oil lamps for hundreds of years. In 1938, popular mechanics ran an article called New Billion Dollar Crop. It was the first time the words billion dollar were used to describe a U.S. agricultural product. Popular mechanics said, and I'm quoting, A machine has been invented which solves a problem more than 6,000 years old. The machine is designed to remove the fiber-bearing cortex from the rest of the stalk making hemp fiber available for use without a prohibitive amount of human labor. Hemp is the standard fiber of the world. It has great tensile strength and durability. It is used to produce more than 5,000 textile products, ranging from rope to fine laces. And the woody herds remaining after the fiber has been removed contain more than 77% cellulose and can be used to produce more than 25,000 products, ranging from dynamite to cellophane, end of quote. Well, since the Popular Mechanics article appeared over half a century ago, many more applications have come to light. But back in 1935, more than 58,000 tons of seed were used just to make paint and varnish, all non-toxic, by the way. These safe paints and varnishes were replaced by paints made with toxic petrochemicals. In the 1930s, no one knew about poisoned rivers or deadly landfills or children dying from chemicals in house paint. People did know something about hemp back then, because the plant and its products were so common. All ship's lines were made from hemp, and much of the sail canvas. In fact, the word canvas is the Dutch pronunciation of the Greek word for hemp, cannabis. Today, many of these items are made in whole or in part with synthetic petrochemicals and wood. All oil lamps used to burn hemp seed oil until the whale oil edged it out at first place in the mid-19th century. 
And then, when all the whales were dead, lamplights were fueled by petroleum and coal and recently radioactive energy. This may be hard to believe in the middle of a war on drugs, but the first law concerning the colonies at Jamestown in 1619 ordered farmers to grow Indian hemp. Massachusetts passed a compulsory grow law in 1631. Connecticut followed in 1632. Names like Hempstead or Hemp Hill dot the American landscape and reflect areas of intense marijuana cultivation. During World War II, domestic hemp production became crucial when the Japanese cut off Asian supplies to the U.S. American farmers, even their sons, were exempt from military duty during World War II. A 1942 U.S. Department of Agriculture film called Hemp for Victory extolled the agricultural might and called for hundreds of thousands of acres to be planted. If hemp could supply the energy needs of the United States, its value would be inestimable. Now that the drugs are is in final retreat, America has an opportunity to once and for all say farewell to the Exxon Valdez, Saddam Hussein, and a prohibitively expensive brinkmanship in the desert sands of Saudi Arabia. This is Hugh Downs, ABC News.